It's one of nature's most efficient ways to kill. Once injected into the bloodstream, it can damage nerves and flesh in minutes and trigger searing pain in seconds. This is venom, a virulent biological toxin and the weapon of choice for thousands of species. But which one is most deadly to man? Of those creatures armed with this lethal cocktail, which is more likely to kill you? Among the world's venomous creatures, there are those whose reputations are infamous, but there are many less well-known killers out there. Everything from mollusks to fish may be armed with onboard biological weapons that are 100% natural and in many cases deadly. But when it comes to human beings, there's always been a great deal of debate as to which of these creatures presents the greatest threat. It has inspired one man to come up with a pioneering new system for ranking the world's most dangerous venoms. Dr. Jamie Seymour is a venom biologist at James Cook University in Queensland, Australia. We want to take the terrestrial snakes, we want to take the marine snakes, we want to take the marine animals, we want to take the whole lot, bring them all together and test that venom drop for drop. And then we want to put in things like how aggressive the animals are and what their population distribution is. This ranking system allows Jamie Seymour to understand the different threats posed by venomous creatures and ultimately to identify measures for minimizing the risks. It consists of five categories. The first is opportunity, or how likely is it that the creature will have the chance to bite. Those venomous creatures living in heavily populated areas will score far higher. Next comes aggression. We're more likely to become victims of aggressive rather than shy species. Then there's the injection mechanism. How well does the animal deliver its venom? Related to this is quantity. In short, the amount of venom delivered in a single bite or sting. Last, but not least, is potency. Just how toxic is the venom? Drop for deadly drop. Considering these five factors together is a brand new approach. And that allows us to compare for the first time ever all these venomous animals and come up with what is the most lethal animal to humans. Not too sure what that'll be yet, but I think we're actually gonna find a few surprises along the way. Let's take a look at the weapon itself. Jenny. While most of us will have heard of venom, how many actually know what it is? Venom is a mixture of biological toxins. Unlike a poison which must be swallowed or absorbed through the skin, venom is injected into the body during a sting or a bite. It can be used for hunting by disabling prey or as a defensive weapon in the face of attack. The difference in strength and how the venom functions will have a significant effect on how it works on the human body something that Jamie Seymour has learned firsthand. His new study will take him up against the creature that most people think of when they hear the word venom, the snake. There are more than 30 species of rattlesnake alone, all carrying different venoms. While some venoms target the body's nervous system, creating havoc with the complex network of nerves that control its vital functions, Others attack flesh and tissue, effectively starting the digestive process before the victim is even eaten. Having bitten its prey, the rattlesnake waits for the venom to take effect before feeding. Someone who has handled plenty of these creatures over the years is Jules Sylvester. Good place. He's been helping movie makers to get their dangerous animal footage for many years. And he's taking Jamie to find North America's most dangerous rattlesnakes and get a venom sample for future testing. But in this rugged terrain, 
This medium-sized rattler is extremely difficult to spot if you don't know what to look for. You can be standing right on top of a meter-long Mojave and still not see it. So Jamie Seymour has taken the precaution of wearing bite-proof Kevlar leg protectors. Oh, Jules, Jules. That's a Mojave. Very, very potent neurotoxin. It's most unusual because most rattlesnakes are hematoxin. Yeah, yeah. That's neurotoxin. The Mojave's venom is a complex cocktail of enzymes and other proteins, forming an incredibly strong neurotoxin, designed to block the firing of nerves, particularly those controlling the muscles. It's the quickest way to stop prey in its tracks. Nothing like the amount of venom we're getting from the other one. Rattles. Knock nerves out, and it's game over. It's paralysis, even death. That's amazing, isn't it? The Mojave rattlesnake is not the only rattler in these parts. In the lower desert nearby is the larger and more infamous Western Diamondback. But despite their overlapping territories, each has a very different venom. Ah! I <laughs> got you. Yeah, I got him. I got him. The Western Diamondback carries hematoxic venom that attacks blood vessels. Like many snake venoms, it starts the chemical breakdown of flesh even before the victim is eaten. Now that is your classic Western diamondback rattlesnake. All the cowboy movies, this is the best Hollywood snake in the world. This, these guys account for more snake bites than any other snake in the country. It's obvious the rattles make a noise. I mean, what do you want it for? It's a warning for probably bison not to step on them. It's a go away, leave me alone. The Western Diamondback is more widespread and likely to be found at the edge of towns and cities. Another American rattler has adapted to a rather different habitat. The Southern Pacific rattlesnake prefers the green coastal climate of the Hollywood Hills. The Southern Pacific rattlesnake is the only one that's venomous in the LA area. Even though we've got thick bush here, we're one hour from Hollywood. Previously categorized as a B grade or low risk, this species is now emerging as a major threat to people living in the Los Angeles basin. As specialist snake bite physician, Dr. Sean Bush knows only too well. Mostly we see Southern Pacific rattlesnake bites because the, those snakes live where the people like to live that is, along the coastline and up in the mountains. These snakes often stray into people's driveways and backyards, and though it may be tempting to try and remove them, it is always best to exercise caution and call for help, as this man discovered the hard way. Took things into my own hands and made a big mistake. And within an hour or two, my hand was blown up like a balloon. This hospital is used to treating several snake bites a day, and when Dr. Bush received a phone call to let him know his own child had been bitten, he feared the worst. My son was actually uh, in the backyard and picked up a little rattlesnake and got bit. We actually had five snake bite patients in the hospital that day. My wife pages me, um, 911, you know, I'm thinking the worst, and I've seen all kinds of bad things uh, happen to people with snake bites. Fortunately, he did well. His hand's just a little bruised right now. He has a little trepidation around snakes now, which uh, maybe he should. Are you gonna touch it? I'm not gonna touch it again. Bye-bye, snake. Bye. With its telltale menacing sound, the rattlesnake is in fact one of the easiest venomous snakes to avoid. The rattle is a benign early warning system, a device for making sure that anything that comes near is made aware of its presence. The way, come on, big boy. Look at that. Isn't that nice? <laughs> a venomous snake stores its venom in glands just behind the eye, where it can rapidly supply venom to the injection mechanism, either hypodermic like fangs or finely grooved teeth. The fangs of rattlesnakes are hinged, 
rotating down into a stabbing position just before a strike. So how do the rattlesnakes we've seen so far score against Dr. Seymour's ranking system? One is particularly dangerous to man. It's the notorious Western Diamondback. Because this rattler is now commonly seen around southern US towns, it has more opportunity to strike at people, which, given its bold, aggressive nature, it frequently does. Its large, hinged fangs penetrate deeply into its victim to deliver its venom. And though not as potent as that of other rattlers, it can deliver enough venom to be potentially fatal if a bite goes untreated. The Western Diamondback is responsible for the most bites and deaths by any reptile in the United States. Next, we head 12,000 kilometers away to Africa, where we discover a snake whose fangs dwarf those of any rattlesnake. Much of Africa's west and central regions are still covered by thick forest. It's here, along the forest's edges, that we find a snake with a particularly dreadful reputation. When it comes to death by lethal injection, the Gaboon Viper really can deliver. This solid-bodied, one-and-a-half-meter but slow-moving snake is a superbly camouflaged ambush predator. It's so well disguised that it's nearly impossible to see it, even when you know it's there. Through its five-and-a-half-centimeter fangs, the longest of any snake, it injects the largest quantity of venom in the snake world. This is thankfully not an aggressive species, preferring to retreat rather than attack if approached. For any snake, envenomation of a human being is a waste of time and energy. A snake who's injected valuable venom into a human victim may have less chance of hunting prey or defending itself from attack until it has replenished its toxic supplies. And there are plenty of animals that will attack even the most venomous species of snake, like the mongoose. And in Mozambique, they face a snake that can deliver its venom long distance. The spitting cobra takes the defensive use of venom into a whole new league squirting venom with astonishing accuracy. Muscular contractions squeeze venom through the fangs, spraying it up to three meters at the eyes of any aggressor, causing irritation and blurry vision. But there's another African snake more deadly than the cobra, the highly confrontational saw-scaled viper. With its subtle signature sound, it inhabits a vast natural range which stretches from North Africa across the Middle East and into Asia to include areas of mass human population, well over a billion people in all. Giving this aggressive serpent plenty of opportunity to bite. <laughs> Professor Julian White is a medical expert in diagnosing snake bites. 10% approximately of acute hospital beds in Nigeria are occupied by snake bite patients, and the overwhelming proportion of those are saw scale viper bites. Its huge range, and the fact that victims are often a long way from proper medical treatment, ensure this is a serious bite risk species. So, while the Gaboon Viper has the most formidable set of fangs and is physically the more intimidating, it is actually the smaller, saw-scaled viper that is the greatest threat to people living in its territory. This deadly predator gets plenty of opportunity to strike. And unfortunately, it is also extremely bad-tempered and is often known to attack humans. Despite its small size, it has an impressive set of folding fangs, which can inject a fatal dose of moderately toxic venom. All in all, it kills thousands of people every year. 7,000 kilometers away in Asia, we find several other contenders for the world's worst venom. 
While most people try to avoid close contact with venomous snakes, here there are some who court danger on a daily basis. Sacred among Buddhists and Hindus, the Asiatic cobra is a confident species and will bite if alarmed. The Asiatic cobra is also a bit of a show-off and its threat posture has become an iconic symbol of Asia. Coming face to face with these snakes, Thai snake charmers uphold a tradition that goes back thousands of years. If any snake had an opportunity to bite handed to it on a plate, it would be this one. Two charmers in this village alone have been bitten recently. But the Asiatic cobra is dwarfed by a gigantic relative, the longest of all venomous snakes, the king cobra. At over five meters in length, the king cobra can raise enough of its body from the ground to stare a standing human in the face. Some have lived to tell the tale. I've been bitten 19 times by the king cobra, and I survived. Many people in our group have been bitten by snakes. It's not just me, it's more than 10 of us. I will keep performing until I die. Many of the charmers who work with king cobras believe they have a high level of intelligence and it's possible the reptilian performers only deliver dry warning bites, injecting minimal venom. In the wild, they mostly save their huge venom capacity for their favorite prey, other snakes. However, this part of Asia does have a problem with another more irritable snake, the Russell's viper. Russell's viper is especially nasty throughout its range. It not only causes um, kidney damage, nasty bleeding effects, and in some places, particularly, for instance, Sri Lanka, can cause degrees of paralysis and muscle damage as well. This snake is one of the most dangerous in all of Asia. Preferring the outskirts of cities, it kills thousands every year. Why are so many people bitten by this species? There are two times a year when Russell's viper bites reach a peak. They coincide with the planting and harvesting of the rice fields. Many of this snake's victims are farmers whose remote rural location prevents them from getting the immediate medical attention this bite requires. It can take days before a victim can reach hospital, long enough for the venom to do serious damage. The Russell's viper strikes at close range and a single bite can deliver over 100 milligrams of venom. As the venom diffuses into the bloodstream, it interrupts the blood clotting mechanism, leading to hemorrhaging and finally to devastating kidney damage. Let's consider the worst case scenario. What do you do if you're bitten by a venomous snake? Forget sucking out the venom. That's strictly for the movies. Wherever you are in the world, a serious venomous snake bite without proper medical attention can lead to permanent injury or even death. In most cases, you need an injection of antivenom. This is an antidote created by injecting small amounts of the true venom into a host animal such as a horse. The immune response which follows produces antibodies against the venom. These are harvested from the animal's blood to make antivenom. We use predominantly horses because one, they're big and you can get large volumes of blood from them without causing any problems to the horses. And the second thing is there isn't a great deal of, of diseases that can be passed on from horses to humans. What basically happens is you take the venom, you inject it into a large horse, you give it a small amount and over time you increase the amount of venom that you give to it. 
What the horse does is its immune system then starts to produce antibodies. If you think it's chewing gum as being this antibody that I'm producing, and I'm the horse. So we'll produce the chewing gum. You have this antibody now, and what happens is the venom is a particular shape because it's going to act and lock in almost like a key into a door. Now if I can take this antibody and wrap that up, that key will no longer work. So it'll float free in the body, but it won't be able to lock on to the bits and pieces in the cells and cause death and problems for humans. While antivenoms will neutralize the toxin, they cannot reverse the process of any damage that's already done. Being monitored in hospital is often essential. But there's one snake bite where even without antivenom, it is possible to survive. The Malayan crate is one of the few Asian snakes carrying a purely neurotoxic venom. As a nocturnal hunter, it stalks its prey in darkness by following scent trails, often entering through an open window or door. And the sleeping inhabitants may never even know they've been bitten, especially since the fangs are very small. As the neurotoxin goes to work, it's only the unnerving paralysis on waking that points to a snake bite in the night. The toxin blocks nerve endings that control muscles, including the rib muscles vital for breathing. But unusually, this venom can work its course through the body, and as long as the victim can be kept breathing through the paralyzing effects, they are likely to survive. While both Russell's viper and Malaysian crate present a serious threat to Southern Asia's human population, it's the cobra that is the greatest danger here. Not the mighty king cobra, the largest venomous snake in the world, but its smaller cousin, the common cobra. And again, we turn to Jamie Seymour's new classification system. The Asiatic cobra is most commonly found on the Indian subcontinent but its habitat extends further into southern Asia and it shares its living space with millions of people. Its confidence also contributes to it biting up to 15,000 people every year. While its fangs are not the biggest, the snake does produce a surprisingly large volume of venom. Thankfully, its venom only scores moderately on our potency scale Nevertheless, it remains one of the biggest killers in the venomous world. But there is one country that tops all the others put together in the venomous snake stakes. Australia. Its species of venomous snake outnumber the non-venomous ones. We've got the most venomous snakes, there's no doubt about that all incredibly venomous. Australia is a big place with vast areas of unpopulated country. The snakes that live here are hardly pushed for space. Yet alarmingly, there are seriously venomous species that have adapted perfectly to the urban lifestyle of Australia's cities. Some eastern brown snake populations now thrive on a diet almost entirely consisting of house mice. A great pest control, perhaps, but being caught by the jaws of this mousetrap is surely worse than having a bad rodent problem. And they inject a good deal more venom than was previously thought, and like a lot of city dwellers, they're easily annoyed. The venom of the eastern brown is particularly unusual because it causes the blood to clot rapidly. However, if you survive, you may later die from hemorrhaging. But only by traveling to the remote regions of the Australian outback can we find the even more venomous and ominously named fierce snake. If that snake with that sort of venom was present in a highly populated area, I suspect you'd be dragging people out of the bush left, right and center as they died. The fierce snake is also known as the inland taipan. It inhabits a harsh and extremely demanding environment. They specialize in hunting native desert mammals, and tracking prey down takes valuable energy, so failure is not an option. 
when the prey turns up, you want to make sure you grab it, you want to make sure you inject it, and you want to make sure it's going to die. So you give it a very potent venom and you give it a heap of it. But fierce by name doesn't necessarily mean fierce by nature. This snake, with the most lethal venom known for any land animal, is hardly ever seen by a human being. It hunts and lives in holes and subterranean tunnels, rarely venturing into the open. But very similar toxins to those found in the fierce snake can also be found in a snake much closer to home. Around Australia's coastlines, we find a highly venomous sea serpent. The olive sea snake is gregarious and confident around human beings and can frequently approach divers and snorkelers. After 10 years working with them, sea snake expert Glenn Burns knows how to handle them safely. Just lift your tail up over the edge of the bank there. The male searching for females at the right time of year, any movement he's usually attracted to, which is why a lot of divers think they're being attacked. A male will come zooming up from the bottom, basically because they don't see very well. They think it's a potential mate, and they'll come zooming over to investigate. They need a powerful, fast-acting venom. If they don't disable the fish quickly, it will escape, and the meal is lost. But of all Australia's snakes, it's not the sea snake that comes out top, nor is it the serpent with the strongest of all venoms, the fierce snake. In Australia, it's the eastern brown snake, which ranks as the most dangerous to people. It is aggressive and fast moving. Fortunately, its fangs are relatively small and it rarely manages to cut through heavy clothing. Historically, eastern browns were thought to produce a tiny amount of venom, but recent studies suggest that this is not the case. And their venom has a rare blood clotting quality, which if delivered directly into the bloodstream, can kill a human in minutes. Australia does have more than its fair share of venomous creatures, and they're not all snakes. There are hundreds of other species that can sting and bite. This is the Sydney funnelweb spider. As its name suggests, it lives in and around the city where it's known to have killed at least 13 people. And these are the only spiders in the world which are truly lethal. Prior to the development of antivenom, there was nothing that medicine could do to guarantee survival, even in an adult, from a major funnelweb spider bite. Both male and female spiders carry venom used for killing their insect prey, but it's the male's extra venom component that's a danger to people. The females seldom leave their underground burrows, whereas males often wander in search of females. It's the males that are the more potent to humans. Part of the reason is when you look at males, they come out of their burrows and they go foraging. The females stay within the burrows and stay put. Staying hidden helps to avoid predators, but for the times when it does venture out into the open, the spider has developed a highly potent toxin which it can use if threatened. Once you come out of your burrow, you're then exposed to predators. Your predators are liable to be marsupials and things of that nature. So you've got to have this extra component in your venom that you can use for defence. There's another venomous Australian spider that resides far beyond the city limits, the redback and it's notorious for lurking in dark, dry places, often right under your nose. In Australia, more antivenom is used to treat redback spider bite than all other bites combined, including snake bite. 
It's a very common problem, with probably greater than a thousand cases receiving antivenom every year. And this species is also well-travelled. They have a fondness for long-haul luggage, and they found themselves 7,000 kilometres away in the port of Osaka, Japan. It arrived on the Osaka docks probably around 1994 and quickly spread so that by 1996 there were probably maybe hundreds of thousands of redback spiders in Osaka. I found higher concentrations around the dock area than you normally see even in Australia. Back in his North Australian lab, Jamie Seymour takes a closer look at these spider venoms. And it is the Sydney funnel web that poses the greatest threat to humans, according to the five-point scale. During the mating season, funnel web males are drawn into gardens and houses, increasing the likelihood of a human encounter. And though it might rather avoid confrontation, it will not shy away from defending itself. Despite feeding mainly on insects, its fangs are long enough to pierce human skin and deliver a small quantity of highly potent venom. Back on our quest to find the world's worst venoms, Dr. Jamie Seymour and venom enthusiast Jules Sylvester head back to the desert in search of the only lethal species of scorpion in the United States, the Arizona bark scorpion. While spiders and snakes deliver their venom through fangs to inject it into the bloodstream, the scorpion uses its sting in the tail. After snake bite, scorpion sting is probably the medically most significant cause of envenoming in the world. We have no idea how many people are affected, but I would suggest it's probably into the millions. Jamie Seymour is back with Jules Sylvester, this time carrying an ultraviolet light to bring out the natural fluorescence of the scorpion's hard external skeleton. This is the big one, but not the bad one. Try under that piece of bark at the top there. That's a bark scorpion. You got one. Grab him, grab him. There he is. You get one? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you got a bark scorpion. Look at that. Up to just 10 years ago, they were losing about 800 people in Mexico just because of this. Seriously, with the, the advent of the anti venom that's, that's fixed that. Improved it a lot. Found in the American Southwest and Northern Mexico, the bark scorpion does encounter human beings fairly often, but is unlikely to sting unless provoked. Being small in stature, it has a relatively modest stinger delivering small quantities of venom. But compensating for its lack of size, its venom is relatively potent, and prior to the development of proper antivenoms, it was a much feared killer. It's back in Africa that we find two other particularly notorious scorpions. This is the powerfully built fat-tailed scorpion. It grows up to 10 centimeters in length. Though its sting is designed to immobilize insects, it can have an equally potent effect on a child, although this species rarely ever injects enough venom to kill a healthy adult. The distinguishing feature of most scorpion stings is that the toxins they contain have a very different effect on the nervous system than any of the snakes we've seen sending it into a kind of physiological overdrive, with heart rate and blood pressure sent soaring. Another African scorpion is a wolf in sheep's clothing. The death stalker more than compensates for its small size and unimpressive looking stinger by having more toxic venom drop for drop than any other species of scorpion. Jamie Seymour's scale highlights why it is so deadly. Opportunity to strike is high. It's the cause of many stings throughout the Middle East and North Africa where it lurks. For aggression, it also ranks highly. They can be very volatile. 
it has a highly effective stinger that easily penetrates human skin. Scorpions restrict the tiny amounts of precious venom they administer with every sting, which is fortunate because the death stalker has extremely potent venom which can cause heart and respiratory failure if injected into a person's bloodstream. For our final group of venomous creatures, we return to Australia, but this time we're underwater. Everything Jamie Seymour needs for this category is right on his own doorstep. Australian waters contain many species of dangerous marine stingers and biters, but sometimes it's not the venom which delivers the lethal blow. And he was present on a particularly fateful day. When Steve Irwin was, was stung with a stingray, I was on, on board and had been for a couple of days with Steve. And what appears to have happened is Steve swum over the back of the stingray. From the animal's point of view, is a big shape coming over the top of it. Big shape in the water normally means big predator. It was not the stingray's venom that actually killed Irwin. It was the puncture wound from the ray's spine. It's not unusual to see, certainly in tiger sharks and other big sharks, these holes or these gaping wounds around sort of the middle of the shark or down through the gills. Think of this as really a sharp knife. So if that's embedded through your chest and ends up, unfortunately, somewhere like your heart, it's not the venom that does the damage from humans, it's more the physical damage from these big spines. There are other marine creatures here that are lethal to human beings. This is the blue-ringed octopus. And this is Dr. Mark Norman. He's an octopus expert at Museum Victoria. These octopuses are equipped with a really good warning system and it's using brilliant blue rings to flash like police lights to say, I am really deadly and if you come too close, I'll bite you. The venom it carries consists of a highly specialised protein called a tetrodotoxin. It has evolved to paralyze prey like crabs quickly. The venom is supplied to the razor-sharp parrot-like beak from large venom glands deep inside the octopus's body, immobilizing its prey. And they have an equally disastrous effect on the human body. In situations where people have died from the bites of these octopuses, they've been handling them and they've bitten with this very powerful saliva going into their bloodstream and within three minutes they're paralysed and they suffocate to death. And in one case in the 1950s, two divers had one, they threw them to each other on the beach and the more they threw the octopus, the brighter the blue rings got. And then the guy put the octopus on his shoulder and said, I'll take it up the car park and show the missus. And while he's walking up the car park, it's bitten straight into his jugular and he was dead within two minutes. Worse still on the list of Australia's most deadly venomous creatures is the harmless looking box jellyfish. Each tentacle is armed with millions of minute spring-loaded stinging capsules. They inject venom into blood vessels just beneath the skin where it travels rapidly through the bloodstream and eventually to the heart. And unfortunately, it inhabits inshore waters, the kind frequented by swimmers. Jamie Seymour has been on the wrong end of the box jelly's tentacles more than once. And I've got to tell you, I mean, it hurts. It's, it's almost a surreal pain but it reaches its peak level almost instantaneously and stays at that level for about 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then it just shuts off. To protect swimmers from the box jellyfish, special nets at the most popular beaches keep them well apart. You see these stinger nets all over the place, and they do a wonderful job. We've never had a fatality or a near fatality sting inside the nets. You swim outside the net, it's not a matter of, of, of if you get stung, it's when you get stung, and it, it's really playing with your life. But the nets, which do a good job of keeping the deadly box jellyfish out, are no barrier against another member of the jellyfish family, 
one of the smallest killers in the ocean. Along coastlines and reefs from Australia to Southeast Asia is the minuscule Irukandji jellyfish. We started getting jellyfish stings of some sort from inside nets. They weren't big box jellyfish stings. They were distinctly different. They were showing distinctly different symptoms. Often no larger than a pea, no normal stinger mesh can keep out the tiny Irukandji jellyfish. As I've duck dived down, I've got stung across the top of the lip. But unlike the box jellyfish, the venom of the Irukandji lingers in the victim's tissues. It's this that gives the sting a delayed reaction. Seymour suspects that it's only when the toxins reach the body's lymph glands that the painful effects kick in. I had severe stomach cramps. Pins and needles through the lower joints of my legs like you would not believe. And we're now getting large quantities of painkillers and, and it was just hell on earth. Far less dangerous to people but fatal to fish is another bizarre marine killer, the cone shell. Whereas most venom's lethal impacts are based on just a few key proteins, that of the cone snail contains hundreds of toxic compounds. Among them are nerve-blocking chemicals that can induce instantaneous seizure and a strong sedative that prevents the prey from struggling. But like most snails, this one operates at a pretty sedate pace. It only needs to feed once a week, and its super strong venom guarantees that when it does hunt down prey, it almost always makes a kill. However, scientists have actually discovered a way to utilize this venom as a super strong painkiller. Now these animals are cone snails. I mean, they're basically little chemists. There's already been a painkiller that's been extracted from the venom, and who knows what else may be in there. Scientists are now beginning to explore the possibilities of using its natural properties to treat serious diseases of the human body. As research continues into the medicinal potential of venom, in the natural world, it's still a formidable weapon. And in the ocean, the deadliest of all venomous creatures is the box jellyfish. It inhabits waters surrounding many popular beaches where stinger nets are deployed to keep bathers safe. It is not an aggressive creature and won't deliberately attack a human being, but nor is it likely to get out of the way. When fully grown, it has over 120 meters of tentacles, armed with millions of tiny stinging capsules, making it highly effective at injecting its venom. The amount delivered depends on how severe the contact with its highly armed tentacles. And it gets worse. The venom it delivers may well be the fastest acting and drop for drop one of the deadliest known against people. In severe cases, death can occur in just two minutes before any chance of medical help. Of all the creatures we've seen in action, from the rattlesnakes of the United States and the venomous spiders of Eastern Australia to octopus and jellyfish, which one is responsible for the greatest number of human fatalities? According to Dr. Seymour's ranking system, we can focus on three final contenders for the title. From the reptile world, it's the feisty, saw-scaled viper, which narrowly edges out the common Asian cobra and Russell's viper to be the world's most dangerous serpent. Among the spiders and scorpions, it's the death stalker that tops the lethal list. And from the marine contenders, it's the ghostly box jellyfish. Surprisingly, Many creatures with extremely toxic venoms measured drop for drop don't feature amongst our finalists, simply because they don't get the chance to encounter humans often enough to rate among those most dangerous to people. But there is one merchant of venom that narrowly defeats all the others in the danger it poses.
According to our key criteria, the most dangerous venomous creature on Earth lacks a big Hollywood reputation. In fact, few of us will have heard of it until now. The saw-scaled viper. You find it through North Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Now, through that area, there's something like a billion people inhabit that area, and probably 60, 70, 80, 100,000 people a year get bitten. Out of that, 20,000 people die each year. Its lethal credentials include a highly potent venom, but what really sends the fatality rate soaring sky high is a unique combination of this snake's aggression and proximity to people, making rapid and efficient medical treatment crucial for survival. Now, it's not because this animal has such a lethal venom that people are bitten and die instantaneously. It's predominantly because they can't get to medical help quickly enough or they don't have good antivenin. Reducing the human death rate from venomous bites and stings means making sure that more people in bite risk zones can get fast and effective treatment. And there is another crucial factor in determining the toxicity of any venom. Among the creatures we've already seen, there are extremely variable reactions to their bites and stings. Take the Sydney funnel web, potentially deadly to humans, its venom has almost no effect on the local cat and dog population. This venom appears to be especially toxic to monkeys and humans, but harmless to felines and canines. However, when it comes to the bite of the North Queensland tarantula, it's the other way around. Human beings suffer localized pain, while cats and dogs usually die. And surprisingly, it is a specific reaction to venom that makes one species an unlikely mass killer. The humble honeybee. While many of us would shudder at the prospect of venomous snakes and scorpions in our backyard, it's actually bee stings that kill more people in the Western world than any other species. It's not direct effects of the venom, but it's because people go through what they refer to as anaphylactic shocks. In other words, they're allergic to these bee venoms. Things happen like your muscles around your neck swell up and you stop breathing, and that's what kills. Such a significant difference in reaction to venoms has also inspired Jamie Seymour to plan another element for his venom rating system. Lab-based experiments designed to find out exactly how severely each of the world's most toxic venoms actually attacks human cells. The reason for this is simple. What they've done routinely is test them on mice or rats, which works well if you want to know how lethal bees are against rats and mice, but it doesn't tell you anything about how lethal they are on human cells. So far, Dr Seymour has begun experiments on human heart cells. Not people, of course, but cell cultures specially grown for the purpose. So these containers here are the key to everything we're doing. Basically what we've been able to do is grow human cells. We have about 10,000 cells in each little well. We can add venom from any sort of animal we want. Having done that, we can then add a dye to it. And that dye will stain up red as the cells die. So more and more cells die, the redder the material in there becomes. The results are already proving invaluable. Venom from the controversial Sydney funnel web spider has been confirmed highly toxic, exceeding the drop-for-drop -drop potency of the deadliest scorpions tested. Among the reptiles, the most toxic venom tested belong to the inland taipan, killing over 60% of heart cells in the first 10 minutes. Thankfully, this snake remains remote from human contact in the Australian outback. But the most astounding result is the extraordinary toxicity of the box jellyfish venom, which began killing human heart cells virtually on contact and which destroyed 100% of all cells within 10 minutes. Jamie Seymour has long suspected that box jelly venom is both extremely potent and fast-acting on humans as well as fish. Now he has the first clinical proof. While his groundbreaking research into the effects of venom on human cells is just beginning, there are scientists already exploring venom's potential to cure arthritis, heart disease and cancer. So these toxins may not always be bad news for human beings. Who knows? We may one day owe our lives 
to some of the most dangerous, venomous creatures in the world. <laughs>